Hi, I'm Paul Germain, and welcome to another session of Smart Boating. You know, if you've watched the show before, you know that we cover a variety of topics from docking to insurance, and the general idea is to help provide you with information that will help you make smarter decisions and have more fun in the water. And this show today is right up that alley, it's on basic safety, which is critically important to your fun in the water. And joining us to help guide us through is Brian Pike, who's the harbor master here at Manchester by the Sea, Massachusetts. Brian? Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Brian, we got a really cool show here today. I think people are going to learn a lot. But before we get into it, can you share a little bit about your boating background and your role as the harbor master? Well, certainly, Paul. I'd be glad to do that. Um, I am from Maine. I worked on the Windjammers, sailing out of Rockland, carrying passengers for mm -hmm. a number of years. Uh, became a licensed merchant marine captain. Okay. Sailed training out of Mystic, Connecticut on a, a another old wooden windjammer, mm -hmm. sailing out to Bermuda and back. I worked as a, a manager of a launch and mooring service company, as well as a dock master at a marina in Salem. Okay. Uh, I then became harbor master in Kittery, Maine, mm -hmm. before accepting the job as harbor master here in Manchester mm -hmm. by the sea. Mm -hmm. And, and are there two or three main functions of a harbor master? There are. Uh, administrative, surprisingly, is a large part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, collecting fees and funds and, and making sure people have all the appropriate things they need to go boating. Right. Uh, safety. Safety. Mm -hmm. And education. And education, okay. And so, a little bit of enforcement. Okay, so those are the top three. Well, you've obviously got just the right experience for our topic today. I so hope so. Why don't we get right into it? Great. Okay. Well, Brian, uh, this topic of safety is a large one, just like a lot of ones that we cover here. We can't cover all the points, but I think we can hit the most important ones this morning. And what I'd like to do is use the U.S. Coast Guard requirements as a foundation, then build from there. You know, I, I was reading, tied into the Coast Guard, I was reading one of their, they do an annual report on accidents, and uh, what I remember, one of the points I remember is that uh, uh, a lot of the fatalities were a result of drowning. I think 80% of fatalities were due to drowning. Correct. And of those, 83% of them drowned because they didn't have a life jacket on. So life jacket sounds like a good place to start for a safety show. Well, if you don't, if you wear a seatbelt in your car, you should be wearing a life jacket on your boat. Right. Uh, th there are many issues with PFDs. Yep. Uh, so uh, one of the biggest things that I see as a harbor master when I ask people to get a life jacket for me to see mm -hmm. is that they can't get to them. Right. They're inaccessible. Very inaccessible. Yeah. Anchors yeah. on top. Right. Uh, bilge pumps, you yeah. name it. Yeah, all uh, the boat junk hooks, is on ladders, top of it. right. Yeah. Yeah. And then they come out wrapped in plastic yes. like this. Yes. So difficult to wear it when it's in the very plastic. Very difficult to wear it when it's in the plastic. And, and you know, doubly difficult to put on with the plastic if you're in the water yes. because your boat sank. Yes, yes. So, yes, yes. Uh, and it's actually law that all PFDs be readily accessible. It's law. Okay, all right. Readily accessible is the language and no longer in the package or with the tags uh, on okay. them. Okay, all right, and that makes perfect common sense, but it could be something that someone overlooked and it's good to refresh on that. Absolutely. So you want to put them in an accessible place, you want to have uh, the right sizes, right? For Correct. The crew that's on board. Um, good for them maybe to get a little bit of instruction how to actually put it on. Mm. Before the boat ever leaves the dock. Before the boat leaves You should the dock, be yeah. putting your passengers into a life jacket that fits them appropriately. Also the law. Yeah. Uh, oh, really? Okay. Nothing more upsetting than seeing an adult-sized life jacket on a small child. Yes. Because what will happen if that child goes in the water, the child will sink yeah. and the life jacket will float away. Right, right. That's terrible. So It is. So there's some real basics there that, again, common sense, putting them out, making sure people know where they are, what they are, how to use them, right? Correct. Okay. Now, there's a variety of sizes here. So someone says, I got it. I need them, it's a Coast Guard requirement. Can you walk us through the different configurations, whether it's verbally or physically with some of the examples? Certainly, certainly. So the first thing I'd like to point out is that your life jacket has to be UL and US Coast Guard approved. Okay. It'll be stamped right on your PFD, no matter what type. Mm -hmm. And it'll also tell you what type of PFD it is. Yeah. So for example, there are 
five different types. Okay. Type one is an offshore life jacket, and we're all familiar with that. It's big, it's puffy, it's orange, looks like a creamsicle. Yeah. yeah really it's... ugly, but they will turn you right side up, face up, in the water, even if you're unconscious. Right. You see those race boat drivers use those. They're yes, big, big, exactly. big jackets. And the they Coast Guard wears those Coast Guard as well. Yep. So yep. Then we have the near shore vest, which is the next best thing. This is the Type 2. Type 2. Not okay. quite as bulky, but right. uh, still uh, orange and uh, they're not terribly comfortable to wear. No, this is very common. Historically, this has been the one most Correct. boaters have used around here, right? Correct. Yep. Then you move into the Type 3 vest. Type uh, 3, okay. Which we have right here in the youth size. Okay. Uh, it's a vest, it's a little more stylish, mm -hmm. a little more comfortable, um, and people are more inclined to wear these, yes. which is very important. Right. If comfortable means people wear it, we move in that direction. Yes. Which brings us to this style here, for example, what you're wearing here. Paul, you have an excellent example of a very good inflatable Type 3 life jacket. Type 3, okay. With a yep. good solid metal rings yep. and webbing. A little yep. bit better than mine with a little plastic rings. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But still, this life jacket that I'm wearing will inflate on its own if I fall in the water. Okay, so it's fully automatic. This one's fully automatic. You have to be careful when you purchase them mm -hmm. to make sure you're buying the appropriate type. Mm -hmm. If you're paddle boarding, buying uh, an inflating PFD, yes. you do not want an auto inflating. Oh, you don't? Okay. Because if you fall in, right, you'll be inflated. That's a good point, yeah. But uh, as a boater, Correct. it seems to me that auto inflate has some benefits because oftentimes you might hit your head on the way out the boat. Correct. You're, not, you're not expecting to go outside the boat to begin Correct. with. Correct. Hit your head, you're not, a, you're not able to orient yourself, so the fact that the vest takes care of going off and keeping you afloat would seem to be a big advantage. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, disadvantages, uh, it may not inflate, yeah. uh, you may not have appropriately changed out your charging system. So this is part of the inflatable this is vest, part of this the, is the thing that makes it blow up. Correct, this is the gas that inflates your jacket mm -hmm. and this little yellow ring here has uh, a powder in it, when it gets wet it expands and triggers this. Fires that off. Now, exactly. Now these, I think they show inspection windows, like I've got an inspection window here for that Correct. Uh, uh, health of that canister, right? Correct. So uh, Paul has a good one, and if you could see that, it has a little green bar on it. Yes. That means the system is active. Right. On this one here, there's a green ring at the bottom. Yeah. If this had been inflated, the only way you'd be able to tell that if it were all closed up again, this would have a red ring. Right, right. So and, th and that there is red, so that would indicate that this needs to be changed. Okay, all right. So maintenance is important. Very. This is often a, a really good solution for boaters, but there's just a little bit of maintenance that you got to keep their eye on. Correct. Right. Okay. Great. Another good policy is everybody wears a life jacket. Yep. All the time. Yep. Yep. Just like we're doing. Exactly. Yep. Beautiful. Fine. You know. Um, one of the things I really like about boating is it's an adventure. You go out, you never know what's going to happen, and that makes it really fun. Uh, unfortunately, the deal with adventure is it can go really well or it can go really badly. That Indeed makes it, it the can. Adventure. <laughs> so, so one thing that plays into that particular aspect is, is the need for visual distress signals. Uh, anything can happen. Your engine can break down, you can hit a submerged object, and, and you need to get some help. You need to make people aware that you need some help. So visual distress signals, or oftentimes referred to as flares, oftentimes fit the bill. Um, there are some Coast Guard requirements on that, right? There absolutely are. So you must have uh, visual distress signals on your vessel if you're over 16 feet long. Mm -hmm. And there's a requirement for types of visual distress signals that you have on your vessel. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as that would happen, if, if we're in the sinking state that you've described <laughs> already, here's a wonderful kit to have on your boat. Yeah, right this is the way most people buy it, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly, because it comes with any number of yeah, important things. For mm -hmm. example, this is a distress flag yep. that you can open up and hang off the boat. Uh, so folks will know that you're in trouble. Okay, this you is take very that important. For me, Paul. Yep. Uh, we have in here also some flares, some flares for a second. Uh, you're required to have uh, flares that are visible at night and during the day. Mm -hmm. Some flares serve both purposes. Yes. 
but uh, universal flares are only so-so and we're going to see two different types that are best under two different conditions. Okay, what else you got in the kit? And then we also have a flare gun for shooting flares into the sky. Yeah, aerial so, flares. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Precisely. Is there anything else in the kit? So away? what else have we got? We usually have a whistle. A whistle. So yeah, well, we're going to be talking about that later, but that's exactly. the part Sound of the Sound making device, always yeah. good. And then one last item in here. Uh, this here is a, a mirror that can be used oh. to signal a, a signal. plane yeah. overhead yeah. or a vessel. Yeah. Okay. So the kit basically has everything I need. Now, uh, do these flares last well, forever? Let's, uh, so I've, I've uh, pulled you over, Paul, and one of the things I want to do is see if your flares are expired or not. Oh, they only have they, a certain life. They have a three-year shelf life three years. from the manufacturer. Okay. If they're older than that, they must be replaced. All right. If well, you're, how, what does this flare look well, like? Well, let's see. Where do you see. read it there? So, here on the red part of your flare, just yeah. below the red cap, yeah. it'll have the manufacturer's date okay. and the expiration date. So that says January 2015, expiration date June 2018. Right, so this, <laughs> this flare will uh, be no good in less than a month, yes. or, or exactly a month, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> That's right. And you need to get new flares right. for so your kit. Now, I would like to add, mm -hmm. There's no need to throw out these expired flares. Okay. As long as you have flares that aren't expired, meet the Coast Guard requirement, it's never a bad thing to have an extra flare. Because after all, if you're sinking, yeah. wouldn't it be nice to have an extra flare? Better to have an extra right. one. Right. How about this gun you were talking about? I guess they have expiration dates on these uh, Just cartridges like as well. Just like your handhelds. And right so down I'm looking, here. Oh, Paul, you're out of compliance. These expired in September of 2013. 2013. Do yeah. you really want to risk your life on old flares? Right, right. So that's an important thing. Very important. Even when you have the kit and it's completely equipped, mm -hmm. the expiration date could have inadvertently gone by. That's right. And you need to be updated on your flares just for your safety. It's your best, personal safety. Best to check your flare kit every single spring before you start boating. Just open it up, look inside, check the dates, less than 30 seconds. Yep. Well, Brian, we've been talking about the importance of having uh, the right complement of flares aboard and the right uh, dates on them so they're within their useful life. Uh, a lot of people, fortunately, haven't had the need to light off a flare. Uh, could you demonstrate so if they do need to do they'll have a clue how to do it? Glad to do that, Paul. Uh, I have here a universal flare. It's good for day or night. Okay. Better for night, but... but um accepted by the Coast Guard for daytime use as well. Mm -hmm. If you look on the black cap here, it shows a sun and a moon. Oh, yeah. That means it's good for day or nighttime oh, use. Good, okay. So, to light a flare, very simple, you take off the black cap. Okay. And your red cap has a little piece of sandpaper. Okay. Pull off your red cap. Okay. This black material right here is what you will strike with the sandpaper mm -hmm. to light the flare. Oh, okay. You'll want to make sure that you're doing it over the side of the boat. Mm -hmm. Okay. One Simple strike as that. should do it. One strike should do it. Your sandpaper uh, will give you three or four good strikes before oh, okay. yep. it comes off. Yeah. And very quickly, we see this red flame coming off uh, the flare. Yes. Make sure that you're holding this flare so that you're not downwind of it. You don't want to be breathing in the smoke and the fumes. Right. And also or get hit by the ash either. Or right? get hit by the ash. Mm. You also want to hold it at an angle. The material coming off the flare is extremely hot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it will burn you and potentially burn a hole in your boat. Okay. Thus adding to your distress. Right, right, yes. So, so at this point, Paul, I'm going to drop this flare in a bucket of water. Okay. And we'll go right to the daytime flare. Good idea. Okay. All right, so this is similar packaging, but a little different function, right? Right, and uh, one indicator that it's different is the black cap shows just the sun, daytime okay. use. Just daytime, And yeah. the color of the packaging, orange. Mm -hmm. This is a smoke flare. Smoke is much more visible during daylight hours. Same exact process. Take off your black cap. Okay. Orange cap comes off. Okay. Sandpaper. Mm-hmm. Okay. We'll give this a moment to burn. All right. So and shortly, 
we're going to see oh wow orange smoke extremely visible during the day <laughs> that is visible. so you can see the value uh, less uh, likely to have hot material yeah. land on you yeah but the same observation that you hold it at an angle mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not obviously be downwind yes well buying you know technologies everywhere these days uh, on the radios, the TVs, whatever it is, and, and, and certainly it's part of the marine industry as well. And, and handheld pyrotechnic flares have been around a long time, and they have some good and some bad aspects to them. And recently, uh, a new form of what they call an electronic flare has been offered to the market. This one, I've got one here in my hand. It's, it's a little bigger, they call it a beacon. Um, what do you see as the pros and cons of of these new electronic beacons versus the older pyrotechnic flares? Well, uh, we'll start out with the cons. I, I do like these. I, I think they're a wonderful addition to the toolbox for getting yourself home safely. Yes. Uh, cons are it's electronic. Okay. We're in a salt water environment. Mm -hmm. um, even though these are sealed, things can go wrong. It could sure. get damaged in storage. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires batteries. Quite so bad, so. your batteries have to be good. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the pros really outweigh the cons okay. when it comes to this device. Uh, as we just showed with the handheld pyrotechnics, those flares there, they have a shelf life. Yep. And they also only burn for a limited period of time, three minutes. Three minutes, yeah. Uh, these here, as long as they have the battery in them, mm -hmm. will run indefinitely. Okay. And that is a great advantage when you want to be seen and safe. Yeah. Now you also need your uh, distress flag right. to go along with this. To have it address both mm -hmm. day and nighttime mm -hmm. visual. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I suspect some folks will decide that they'd like to keep both on the boat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but this here uh, is something certainly uh, I would recommend. Yeah. Yep. It's a good idea. Well, buying another part of the U.S. Coast Guard requirements, if I remember correctly, is has to do with fire extinguishers. And not all boats have to have them. but Many do, particularly those with enclosed spaces, right? That's correct, Paul. Mm. And uh, the type of fire extinguisher you have, the size of it uh, is dictated by the size and type of vessel that you have. Okay, okay. And so I, we've got two different examples here. And mine's, uh, it says here, it's good for trash, wood, and paper, liquids, and electrical equipment, or A, B, and C. Correct. How about yours? So this is a B and C. B this and is C. for burning liquids and electrical fires only. Okay. Not uh, considered adequate for ash producing or type A fires. Right. But the B would be the right one for a boater, right? All vessels are required to have a type B. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, mm -hmm. not a bad idea to have an extinguisher that's an ABC. Right. Especially if a cooking facility or something Why like not? that. Why right. not? Uh, and then the numbers represent how much charges in each one? The volume of firefighting material inside the cylinder. Okay. That's what your number represents. The letter is the type of fire. Right. The number is the volume. Right. And these, uh, I don't know, people are used to the shape and the size. People have seen fire extinguishers for a long time, maybe even consider them decoration to a certain extent, but they're really not decoration. And they really need to be uh, well maintained. Because they, they have a dial where you can see the, uh, the health of them, right? Absolutely, Paul. And it's always wise, again, to check that at the beginning of the boating season, mm -hmm. uh, maybe in the middle of your boating season. Mm -hmm. Because, gosh, if you have a fire, it's awfully nice to have a working fire extinguisher on board. It sure is. It sure is. And a lot of boaters will have the right fire extinguisher on board. But thank God they haven't had to use it yet. But in the case they would have to use it, I'm a little concerned they may not know how. So could you demonstrate how they'd use a fire extinguisher? Sure, I can do that, Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's actually very, very simple. Okay. Uh, the thing to remember about a fire extinguisher, you want it to put out the fire where the fire is actually burning, mm -hmm. not the flames that are shooting into the air. Yes. You, don't, you don't aim your fire extinguisher at those flames. Okay. Yep. You aim your fire extinguisher at the base of the flames. Yes. Standing about six feet away, if you can. Yep. Uh, you don't want to be too close. Right. You have to use the extinguisher on yourself. Right, sure. Aim, pull the pin, which we'll do in a moment, mm -hmm. squeeze the trigger, and sweep from side to side. Okay, okay. And that should extinguish your flame. All right, all right. Well, now, let's give it a go here. We will. 
Okay. Well, one thing I'd like to point out, yep. it's easy to buy the cheapest, smallest fire extinguisher you can find. Yes. If you had a fire on board, it might be nice to have a slightly larger fire extinguisher. Good point. Good point. For you know, short money, correct. you get a lot more protection. So for demonstration purposes, we have this trash barrel. Mm -hmm. We're going to produce a lot of material. You and I may temporarily disappear in the yeah, cloud. Yeah, sure. Um, we'll pull the pin okay. right here. All right. Like so. Okay. It's now like a hand grenade. Yes. We stand back. Okay. Aim. Yep. Pull the trigger. Pointing at the base of the fire. Base of the fire. Mm -hmm. Sweeping back and forth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that, you can see how much material was in just this small extinguisher. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, very important, when there's a fire on your boat, point your boat into the wind so that the fire is at the back of the boat, downwind as much as possible. Yep, give this a chance to do its work. Exactly, and uh, remember your fire extinguisher, just like your flares and your PFDs must be in a readily accessible location. Well, Brian, when you're looking at the checklist for U.S. Coast Guard requirements, certainly you get life jackets and flares and fire extinguishers. And another important aspect of that, particularly for boats that are running sunset to sunrise or limited visibility uh, running lights, right? Correct, Paul. Yeah, and then there's two different arrangements you've got to have at a, at a minimum for most boats? Right, so uh, it has a lot to do with the length of your vessel mm -hmm. and the type of vessel, but uh, if you think of any vessel propelled by any mechanical means, it's required to have running lights. Right, which you see right down underneath correct, here. Correct, your, yep. your red and your green, mm -hmm. and a white all-around light. Yeah also known as an anchor light. Right, right. Because you're going to use a different configuration underway, right? You're going to have your bow lights and, and the navigation part of that light mm -hmm. on. And if you're an anchor, you're going to be just using the, the anchor light Correct. right? Correct. That is correct. Yeah. Now, we're in a saltwater environment. Does that, you find that causes problems for boaters in terms of keeping their lights working? Is there any maintenance involved? Well, Paul, I, I would just suggest that if you're out boating at night, mm -hmm. Uh, never trust that the vessel coming toward you has lights that are working adequately. Mm. Uh, it's a lot of maintenance and a lot of work to, to keep these uh, electrical things running right. in the saltwater environment, as you pointed out. Right, so it's another maintenance thing that is a Coast Guard requirement. Mm -hmm. Do you want it? Have it for your own safety, anyways, but you got to look after it maybe before you go in for the season, maybe mid season, to make sure they're working properly. Mm -hmm. right? Correct. Yeah. Well, Brian, you know, uh, a couple things that I think might sometimes get overlooked that are, again, Coast Guard requirements for boats over 16 feet is a, a audible device, a horn mm -hmm. or a whistle, and sometimes you use that in conjunction with a throwable. Can you talk a little bit about this? What do you think of a uh, whistle versus horn trade-off? Sure, sure. Well, there are some trade-offs, as with anything. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your Type 4 throwable device is just another PFD. Yes. Uh, it's always better not to discuss these with PFDs because this it does not count when the harbor master pulls up and says please hold up your life jacket. Yeah. This device is meant to be thrown to a person in the water to give them something to hang on to until they can be rescued. Yeah. Um, How about so, this? How do these two maybe marry uh, together? Well, should we give them a demo? Well, go right ahead, Paul. <laughs> so, it's pretty loud. as you can tell, that is extremely loud. Yes. And it will be loud right up until all the material in this canister is gone. Mm -hmm. If you have a second canister, wonderful. But once this runs out, what are you going to do? Right, OK. If you need that much sound signaling, you can carry either a whistle, mm -hmm. which we showed in the, the uh, kit. flare canister, mm -hmm. or you can actually get a handheld horn that you blow like a trumpet, Okay. Uh, which is a, a great secondary device to have on board. They come in very small sizes now and make an incredibly loud sound. Wow, okay. So a good secondary device to have on board. Good point. Well, Brian, there are a lot of fundamentals to safety and, uh, you know, you have to, uh, it's good to know where you are, you have a chart and compass. It's good to have an anchor to hold you in place. But oftentimes today, the way of getting help is through a marine radio. So that makes a marine radio critically important and, and knowledge of how to use the radio too, right? Absolutely, Paul. It's one of the most important pieces of equipment you can have on your vessel. Mm -hmm. I have a handheld here. This vessel also has a mounted radio uh, with a DSC button. 
-hmm. And when you have your radio registered uh, with the Coast Guard with your DSC button, mm -hmm. if you should find yourself in distress, you press and hold that button for five seconds, a signal goes out that transmits your location and uh, the identifying features of your vessel. Okay. To okay. every vessel within radio range. All right. So that's going to dramatically speed the rescue right, effort, right? Right, right. Yep. Correct. Yeah. As I like to say, the search goes from the Atlantic Ocean to your location. Yes, that's so. important. And, and, and the newer radios, the newer handhelds, a lot of them uh, seem to offer floating capability in case it goes overboard and the integral DSC feature on them, right? So it, it can be a worthwhile investment to spend 150 bucks or something to get up to date on your on your handheld, right? I couldn't agree more. This handheld, while it does not have the DSC, it's not that new, it does float mm -hmm. and it is waterproof. Yes. If I found myself in the water, it'd be awfully nice to have a radio to call for help. That's for sure. And uh, something that many folks aren't aware of now, uh, Coast Guard has the capability when you press your send button on your uh, marine VHF radio, mm -hmm. they can get a direct line of sight, straight line from the Coast Guard station to where the signal is coming from. Wow. It's wow. not a triangulated position, right, right, but right. it sure is a, a great start. Yeah, and uh, it's going to compress that rescue time. Correct, yep. which is what we want. Right, exactly. Well, Brian, you know, when I'm thinking safety, and, and I've got to be honest with you, I think it more in the spring and the fall because the water's colder and there's less people out there, but it's a good idea year round. I think of a float plan and I, and I touch base with relatives and, and tell them a little bit about what's going on with me and my boating. Can you explain about a float plan a little bit more and, and why it's a good idea? Absolutely, and for some of the reasons you've just stated, time of year, water temperature, timely rescue. Uh, there are some important elements of a float plan. You should have the names of all the persons that are going with you. Okay. Uh, a description of the vessel. Mm -hmm. uh, what, where are you going? Yes. What time are you leaving and what time are you expected back? Okay. And you do leave this information with a friend or a family member and tell them, if you don't hear from me by yep. 6 p.m., yep. please call the Coast Guard, Harbor Master, uh, environmental police call somebody yes. and let them know that I'm overdue. Right. So it's very simple. It can be just, you know, exactly. notations. It doesn't have to be anything formal, but to take that information, share it with someone. A note on the kitchen table. Key. Yes. Key, right? With all of that information. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Brian, you know, uh, time to wrap up the show today. And, and we've been fortunate enough to cover a lot of ground and important aspects like uh, PFDs and flares and fire extinguishers and that sort of thing. Um, and one of the things that pops out for me is the importance of having your act together in this area. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up the show today? A couple things, Paul. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend that you boaters take a safe boating course, a NASBLA approved, U.S. Coast Guard approved safe boating course. Mm -hmm. It'll give you a lot of good basic information mm -hmm. and it'll give you a certificate that's good in all 37 states that require it and the Canadian Maritimes. Mm, that's uh, nice. I also recommend a U.S. Coast Guard auxiliary uh, vessel safety inspection. Mm -hmm. They'll come down and inspect your boat for free. Mm -hmm. If there's any equipment you don't have, you don't get a ticket, you just get that proper equipment. They'll come back and give you a sticker to put on your boat. Okay. And you'll avoid uh, potential boarding for a safety inspection right. by Coast Guard or a Harbor Master. Right. So that's a nice thing. Now, if they have questions, they live around here locally, they have questions. Is there a website or an email address they can use to reach you at? Uh, I'd like to offer that any boater could reach me at mm -hmm. harbormaster at manchester dot m a dot u s. All right. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure, Paul. And thank you, Smart Boating viewers, for joining us today. If you have comments or questions, feel free to visit us on our website, www.smartboatingus.com. Thank you.